experience the wonder and beauty of butterflies, moths, and other native pollinators that are working hard to keep our ecosystems and our food crops intact. Find out what you can do to provide nectar sources for pollinators in your garden and help keep our world going round on its reproductive cycle. That's next on Wildlife Matters. This program is made possible by the Florida Wildflower Foundation and the Florida State Wildflower License Tag and by the following generous contributors. This is a story about one of the world's most vital processes linking plants and animals, a process that not only keeps our ecosystems full of diversity, but feeds human beings and every animal, both wild and domestic. The process is known as pollination, the picking up and transfer of pollen by an animal from one plant to another in order to produce more plants and create fruits and vegetables. It's a process that's easily forgotten by most of us today who don't often visit natural areas and who gather our fruits, vegetables, and meats not from our farm, but from the supermarket, polished and shrink-wrapped. Because native pollinators are so important to our lives here on Earth, and because studies show native pollinators are declining worldwide, we'd like to show you some of the bewildering and exceptional shapes, colors, and behaviors of the large variety of native pollinators that pollinate our wildflowers and our food crops. We hope that by doing so, you will not only make a place for pollinators on your property, but will also make a place for them in your heart. If you were to take some time to browse through your local produce market, looking at all the fruits, nuts, and vegetables on display for your choosing, you'd find many would be gone if it were not for native pollinators. Squash, mangoes, cashews, blueberries, strawberries, carrots, onions, coconuts, and many other foods are all created with the help of native pollinators. In fact, native pollinators provide one-fifth of all crop pollination. Not only is the diversity of our agriculture dependent on native pollinators, the diversity in our ecosystems is entirely dependent on them. 90% of native flowering plants rely exclusively on native pollinators for reproduction. This pollination process is accomplished by a myriad of native wildlife, ranging from bats to birds. But of the thousands of pollinators in the United States and Canada, 99% are insects. These insects are responsible for keeping food on our tables and our ecosystems healthy and full of life. Solitary bees, wasps, butterflies, beetles, Flies and moths are hard at work 24 hours a day, not only making sure humans are fed and clothed, but all of our domestic animals and their wild cousins are also fed. But with a growing population and the rate at which human beings are clearing land, native pollinators are losing their basic life support system, nectar sources in the form of native wildflowers. Many of us are unaware of the critical link that exists between our pollinators, our native wildflowers, and our food supply. But without all of these remaining healthy, none are possible. Mary Horan lives in Newport Ritchie, Florida, and grows a variety of vegetables in her yard, all of which she and her husband cherish. But it hasn't always been this way. When Mary first started out, there was no buzzing going on around her blooms. That's when she discovered the critical link. I tried to grow a few vegetables. I couldn't get my cucumbers to produce any fruit. And when I went to the extension service, they said, well, you know, you really have to have bees in order to uh, pollinate uh, 
that they help a lot. And so then I, I initially gave up on uh, growing vegetables and just focused on increasing the pollinators in my yard uh, by uh, increasing the number of native plants that I had. Mary learned that in order for her crops to produce vegetables, their flowers had to be fertilized. And to be fertilized, she needed pollinators. You see, plants are like animals, they reproduce sexually. But because plants are unable to move around to get together to mate, most rely on animal pollinators to move the male pollen grains from one flower to the female stigma of another flower of the same species. When this happens, reproduction occurs and seeds and the accompanying fruits or vegetables are created. Because the popular non-native ornamental plants often used in landscapes do very little to support native pollinators, Mary had to find out more about the native plants pollinators require for food and shelter. Native plants are those that historically occurred within America before European settlers arrived. I went ahead and started going on some field trips with my husband. We visited some botanical gardens to see uh, what native plant sections looked like. Uh, I also started going on field trips with our chapter uh, and that gave me an opportunity to talk with some of the experts and to see the plants growing in the wild. As Mary planted the appropriate native plants in the appropriate places in her yard, she soon began to see a lot more bugs buzzing her wildflowers. Then her desire for homegrown vegetables re-emerged. Then after I began to get more pollinators in the yard and butterflies and with the native plants, I became interested again in uh, growing vegetables. Mary's realization that native pollinators were required to produce vegetables and fruits was very accurate. In fact, at least 800 cultivated plants rely primarily or to some extent on wild insects and bees for pollination, an amount to the order of at least $4.1 billion per year for the U.S. economy. By adding native wildflowers to her yard and giving pollinators the native vegetation they need to stay alive, the pollinators return the favor by pollinating Mary's vegetables and giving her a generous harvest. Now that I have more pollinators in my yard, I'm beginning to have much larger crops of vegetables. So now I am growing tomatoes, green peppers, green beans. Uh, I'm starting zucchini and cucumber. I also have grown green onions and lettuce. Now, Mary and her husband enjoy delicious chili in the wintertime with vine-ripened tomatoes and luscious salads in the summertime with just-picked greens, thanks to her native pollinators, made possible by the native nectar, pollen, and larval food plants in her yard. I feel like that I have a variety of different bees. Behind me is a Carolina jasmine, and when that blooms in the late winter, it is covered with bees. Uh, they really like that. Native wildflowers provide butterfly food in the form of nectar and pollen, but caterpillars which metamorphose into butterflies require special kinds of native plants to feed on. These plants are called host plants, and butterflies are not possible without them. So some of the things I've planted in my yard that are attractive to butterflies uh, are the passion vines, which attract the gulf fritillary and the zebra longwing. Uh, I also have a Hercules club, which uh, is a plant that is the larval food for the giant swallowtail, and those are just beautiful butterflies. I love watching them. I also have uh, grown some wild petunia uh, and some twin flower that attract uh, the buckeye. Like Mary, if you can attract an abundance of insect pollinators to your yard, there's a good chance the natural areas surrounding your property are in good condition. If you cannot, the wildlands around you are most likely impoverished.
It's the same with the fields and orchards that sustain our food crops. In order to be productive, the wildlands around them must be kept intact for pollinators, or their yields will suffer. I think it's very important that we have habitat for our native pollinators. You know, in, in years past, our smaller farmers always let the areas between their plots grow wild so that there was a habitat for the native pollinators. But it is a real problem in our big farming uh, co-ops where we have massive fields and there may not be the habitats that are needed. Everyone can influence pollinator populations through the choices they make, whether farming a piece of land, managing public land, or maintaining a garden. You really can make a difference like Mary and find a sense of peace and purpose in the process. Now that I have native plants in my yard, it's much more interesting. Uh, it's enjoyable to sit out in the yard and to be able to watch the butterflies, to watch the bees uh, going between plants. Uh, it's just a lot more fun. Probably the most interesting and attractive wild insect pollinator is the butterfly. These iridescent creatures are eye-catching just like the wildflowers that sustain them. Because of the warm climate, butterflies in Florida are often in flight year-round. And the blend of butterflies here is unique to anywhere else in the world. Florida has a terrific butterfly fauna. We have about 170 species of breeding butterflies here. And that includes butterflies from the Caribbean, um, Eastern North American butterflies, butterflies that are most closely related to uh, southwestern desert uh, species. And then we have our own homegrown local butterflies that are found nowhere else but Florida. Because our natural ecosystems are held together by native pollinators, industrious insects are working around the clock to make sure everyone has enough to eat. Butterflies pollinate during the day, and moths, the butterfly's nocturnal cousins, pollinate during the night. Whether it's by day or night, butterflies and moths and native plants rely on each other for survival. The reason butterflies and moths come to flowers is for food. They, fl the flowers provide um, nectar and in some cases pollen uh, for the butterflies. Flowers gain pollination service from, from insects. They uh, often uh, cannot self-pollinate. They, they must, the pollen must come from another individual of that same species. Because butterflies are cold-blooded, they need to sit in the sun to warm their bodies before they can begin pollinating. That's why you won't see them active early in the morning. But once they get warmed up, they're ready for a drink. Butterflies and moths have sucking-type mouth parts. Their, their mouth part is a long, flexible tube. It's normally kept tightly coiled underneath the head when not in use. But when they land at a flower, they can extend the tube and uh, like a straw, and it has muscles. They can move it around to and find the very base of the flower where the nectar glands are and where the nectar is located, and then they simply suck it up. In the act of trying to find the nectar in the flower, the butterflies uh, are being dusted uh, by the pollen in the anthers of the flower. So they may gather uh, pollen on their proboscis as they curl and uncurl it into the flower or their face may be dusted with pollen, or just the undersides of their body, wings, or legs will gather pollen as they move around the flower. And uh, of course, then when they go to the next flower, some of that pollen will rub off onto the female part of that flower, and the pollen will have been trans transferred and it will be pollinated. While butterflies and moths rely on nectar for their nourishment, one in particular has a passion for pollen let me tell you about a really interesting butterfly that we have here in, in Florida. It's our state butterfly. It's the zebra heliconian, or sometimes called the zebra longwing. And this is a very long-lived butterfly. Most butterflies live a week or maybe three or four weeks at maximum. This butterfly lives for months, two or three months at a time. And as a result, it, it can't possibly store enough nutrients uh, just from the larval feeding to uh, make sure that all of the uh, eggs are produced. 
And so as a result, the females of the zebra heliconian visit flowers, not just for nectar, but also for pollen. This is very unusual in moths and butterflies. This is the only species I know of that does this, but the females actually gather a ball of pollen on the tip of their proboscis, and they digest that externally and suck up the nutrients. And that pollen is very rich in proteins. So the extra protein that they're getting from the pollen helps them to develop their eggs and lay eggs over many months of time. At about the time humans go inside for the night, other insects are just getting started. Moths are one of them. Another interesting uh, pollinator that we have uh, are the hawk moths. And um, these are very interesting because they range from some of our largest moths in wingspan uh, to some of uh, a smaller moth size. But uh, their, their greatest uh, feature is that they can hover over flowers, uh, just like hummingbirds do. And in fact, many people mistake these for hummingbirds in their garden. If, uh, if you have a garden with lantana or pentas or other kinds of flowers, and you go out at dusk, you'll see these, these hawk moths hovering over the flowers and feeding uh, just at that time. Many tubular wildflowers are fashioned precisely to attract butterfly pollinators, and butterflies are genetically programmed to respond to these types of flowers. Thousands of these fragile pollination partnerships keep our native ecosystems productive and flexible. But we must be mindful, these relationships are delicate, and when humans contribute to the demise of one partner, the other partner is also wiped out if it's reliant on only that one partner. This process is known as linked extinction. Unfortunately, examples of localized pollinator declines and disrupted pollination systems are being reported on every continent except Antarctica. The resulting impact on pollination-dependent flowering plants could be devastating. Experts predict 20,000 flowering plant species will vanish in the next few decades. This impending pollinator crisis is being brought on by land conversion and chemical inundation. In Florida, rapid growth destroys 50,000 acres of wildlife habitat each year. Other states around the country are not much different. Additionally, our excessive use of pesticides, such as insecticides and herbicides, on farmland and in our yards is threatening pollinator survival. When you think about it, long before there were subdivisions and strip malls in your area, the original natural vegetation provided continuous protection and food sources for all animals, including pollinators. Beyond decreasing our use of harmful chemicals on the land and protecting natural land from development, the most important thing we can give our native pollinators is the native wildflowers they depend upon for survival. There are many different types of plants you can plant in your garden. Uh, the number one characteristic is they have to have nectar in them. And uh, some, some good ones are uh, tropical sage, salvia coccinea, uh, beautiful wildflower, uh, and it grows well in gardens. And another great one is pickerel weed. This is a plant that grows in wetlands. So if you have a wet garden, a wet ditch, uh, pond margin, uh, this would be a beautiful native wildflower to plant that would be very attractive to various kinds of, of native butterflies. Like birds and other wildlife, butterflies, moths, and pollinators in general are fun to watch. They bring a joy to our lives that nothing can replace. Insects and plants, these are our, our treasures that we have here and we live with every day, and that's what we're hoping to maintain through time is, is all the species we have, including the pollinators like butterflies and moths. Bringing diversity to your yard can be easily achieved by planting native plants that have flowers with pollen and nectar. By becoming familiar with native plants, finding a native plant nursery in your area, and experimenting with natives in your yard, your wonders will never cease. I've been doing it in my yard, and I love my yard now more than ever. 
Hi, and welcome to my home in Orlando, Florida. We have a lot of pollinators in our yard because our yard is bug friendly. Number one, because we have a lot of native pollinator plants, and number two, because we use very little pesticides and herbicides. Come on, I'll show you around. Here's a wonderful native pollinator plant called the Spanish needle. This plant has white petals on its flowers in a yellow center, and it is very attractive to butterflies and all kinds of pollinator insects. A lot of people think of this plant as a weed, but to butterflies, it's the most attractive plant in the entire neighborhood. I've seen the great southern white out here, the monarch butterfly loves it, the white peacock. It's a wonderful plant for pollinators called the Spanish needle. Here's a beautiful blue native pollinator plant called the blue curls. They call it the blue curls because these beautiful blue purple flowers have curly cues on them that make them very original. This plant blooms in late summer and when it blooms, it blooms. This thing has blue flowers all over it that the pollinators just love, particularly bees. And you'll see the little bees sticking their heads deep down to get the pollen and the nectar, and it's called the blue curls. This vine growing on the ground here is another native pollinator plant called the passion flower. This is the host plant to three of the butterflies we have in Florida, the Gulf Littleary, the Julia, and the Zebra Longwing. What happens is the butterflies seek out this plant and lay their eggs on it. The eggs turn into caterpillars and the caterpillars turn into butterflies. So we need this plant in our gardens in order to have populations of these butterflies. When this flower blooms, it blooms a beautiful purple flower that looks like something from outer space. It's so cool looking. But when I look out our window, I see the zebra long wings just hovering around this plant all day long, laying their eggs. So it's an excellent native pollinator plant called the passion flower. This native plant in our wildflower garden is called the sensitive mimosa, and every day it makes beautiful puffball flowers that are pink that the bees just love, particularly the honeybee. And you'll see this honeybee right here. He is buzzing up and down the flower, just collecting pollen like you would not believe. So this honeybee just loves the sensitive mimosa. Here's another great native pollinator plant called the bee balm. And the reason it's called the bee balm is because the bees go crazy over this plant. You'll see them when it blooms, just hovering around it, patrolling the area, protecting it from other bees. It's probably the most attractive plant to bees in my entire yard called the bee balm. Here are a few tips to help attract native pollinators to your landscape. One, plant five to 10 flowering plants native to your area. Two, offer nesting materials such as dead branches and leaves and bare ground for ground nesting pollinators. Three, try to eliminate the use of pesticides such as insecticides and herbicides in your yard as these are harmful to pollinators. Four, include host plants for butterfly caterpillars. And five, find local resources familiar with native plants, like your county extension agent, local native plant society, or in Florida, the Association of Florida Native Nurseries. In order to increase the local abundance of rare butterflies and all of our priceless native pollinators, we need to grow native nectar and larval plants in all public and private landscapes and use them in the regreening of highway right-of-ways and in landfills. You can help by introducing butterfly and pollinator food plants into your landscape. People can do almost anything if they put their minds to it. Uh, if you live in a deed-restricted community, you can still plant native plants because there are many beautiful and decorative native plants that would more than meet the homeowner association's requirements. If you live in a condo, you could plant native plants, uh, pollinator plants, 
in pots. One of the most important things people could do is to plant native plants in their garden. If everybody planted at least one plant, uh, pollinators would have uh, a feast of food available for them. Uh, some places, some urban places, it's hard to find a native plant these days uh, because it's all plants from somewhere else. And live modestly. You can live well living modestly and, and preserving the earth. Pollinator gardens cannot take the place of all human disturbances that damage fragile pollinator and plant relations. Future habitat destruction must be prevented. But pollinator gardens can help provide pollinators with the food, water, and shelter they need to create a seamless transition from wildland to cultivated land and back again. I hope this program has made you realize that the fate of humans and pollinators are intertwined. So please do your part by planting native flowering plants on the property you control in order to help our priceless native pollinators. Don't miss part two of this program called Gardening for Native Pollinators that emphasizes bees and other insects. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Wildlife Matters. To share your feedback about this program or to order a copy of Gardening for Native Pollinators Part 1, Emphasizing Butterflies and Moths, plus additional programs in the Wildlife Matters series, please visit our website at www.naturewisetv.org. This program was made possible by the Florida Wildflower Foundation and the Florida State Wildflower License Tag and by the following generous contributors. Wildlife Matters is created and produced by NatureWise Incorporated, dedicated to improving the environment through educational television and video.